the activity. Oh, of course, thanks, Potenza. Um, so just to, some housekeeping to let you know, we are recording the session this afternoon um, and everybody's doing this already, but if you can just keep your camera off um, to help with the bandwidth while we're chatting um, um, and mute yourself when you're not speaking. Um, if you do have any questions, if you can raise your hand or pop them in the chat and we will pick them up from there. Um, so as I say, this is a look back at our activities for 2020. I think it's fair to say it didn't go quite the way we planned or how anybody planned. Um, I suppose the big thing to talk about is the fact that, we had, first of all, we had to cancel our um, anticipated conference um, in Aviemore, which was such a shame. Um, we did reschedule for 2021, but of course, by December 2020, we realised that that wasn't going to be feasible either. So we did have to come to the difficult decision to cancel it. Um, we'd like to take this opportunity to thank Carol Stevenson for all her hard work in helping us source the venue and organise the logistics for the conference for many years. Um, we did manage to run some other CPD events, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, but while I'm thanking people, I'd also like to take the opportunity to thank our outgoing co-chair, which is Sarah Hennessy. She stepped down in September, um, and of course that was when I joined um, as the new co-chair. Um, Yes, many thanks to Sarah, um, she's done lots of work and big shoes to follow. Um, I'd also like to thank Neela Dracup, who stepped down as our secretary last year. Um, um, the issue is still available online if people would like to see that. Um, the other big thing that happened at the end of last year with newsletter is that we went, um, hopefully people have had a chance to see that. Um, if I can just move and um, ask your potential to move on to the um, the infographic we've produced for this year. I think that's probably an easier way to see some of the details of the things that we've done over 2020. Um, actually, I do apologise before I go to that. Um, can we have a look back at the minutes for last year? I completely forgot. Um, we should actually um, just check the accuracy of last year's AGM minutes and um, second them. I'm so sorry. Um, if we just scroll through the pages, if anybody has any questions or amendments, um, please put up your hand or, or let me know. So are there any corrections from page one? I'm in. Oh, thank you. There's a correction from Ruth to correct 2019 from, from 2020 is the days the last year's AGM. So we can make a note to change that after the meeting. Thank you, Ruth. Okay, and any corrections? Any more corrections from page one? Okay, on to page two. Okay, that's the final page, isn't it? So if there are no corrections, um, can we ask for someone to second that they are an accurate representation of last year's AGM? That's brilliant. Thank you, Maria. Okay, thank you. 
Um, Leslie? Not sure, Leslie, is that a question or was that a second? <laughs> Okay. Sorry, Lindsay, I, I couldn't, sorry, Lindsay, I couldn't unmute. Um, <laughs> so I was just seconding it, sorry. That's brilliant, thank you. I think that's second and third did then, that's great. Um, um, as Potenza says, we will correct that the, the date and the, the, the minutes and get that back uploaded onto the website. You can see these all on the, the HRD website as well. Okay, so if we go back to the infographic for 2020, Um, so we've put this together just to give um, a, a bit of a look, so we do quite a lot over there. Um, if you can just scroll down for me a bit, Potenza. Um, so the first thing to, to, to look at was um, what we did in policy last year. Um, so the HRD's contribution to Philip's wider public policy was formalised through membership of the new civil policy committee. Um, the group also responded to the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy call for the evidence on the recognition of professional qualifications and regulations of professionals. It's quite a mouthful. Um, advocating librarianship as a chartered profession with the clear skills pathway and professional development framework. Um, and if I move on to the events that we did last year, again, these all moved online, um, so, but we were still able to run them. Um, the post-presentation skills, reflective writing, um, they were both meant to support the conference, but um, hopefully they have wider um, use in, for other, other occasions. So, um, you know, they're sent to their own for people. Um, in May, we did a, a session on grey literature, which was really well attended. We had over 200 attendees at that, so that, that was um, quite a successful one. We hope to run something similar in the future. Um, our publications continued as normal over 2020, so we have the HLG newsletter. As I say, it was published three times, and um, the last one was when we were moved on to mine. Um, HLG nursing bulletin, again, um, was published three times over 2020, including the tribute to Shane Godbolt. Um, and the medical core collection is still currently working on updating the, uh, the latest version of that. Um, our membership has stayed fairly healthy. We've still got just over a thousand uh, members. Um, we're gaining uh, members on Twitter. Um, and again, our finances there are there in detail for you to have a look at. I won't read, I won't start reading out the numbers, but you can see they're there to look at. Um, does anyone have any questions on our activities for 2020? No? Okay, well, just to see again, if anybody wants to have a look at these in more detail, they are on the Senate website. If there are no questions, then I will close the formal part of the AGM. Okay. Um, so moving on, the annual report that we've looked back, of course, does cover the, the, um, the course of 2020. We do have some new recruits that have joined us in 2021. So I just wanted to take this opportunity to introduce Samantha Gavigan, who is our new Honorary Secretary, who started in May, and also our Deputy Newsletter Editor, Sarah Denman, who also started in May. So very pleased to welcome them on board to the committee um, and look forward to working with you over the year. Um, Potenza, is it possible to stop sharing screens now? That's brilliant, thank you. Um, 
So before we get to our talk at one o'clock, I now have a lovely job of presenting this year's Cyril Barnard Memorial Prize um, to a very deserving recipient. In normal times, we would have given the award over in person at the conference in Aviemore, but unfortunately due to well, circumstances that we're all very aware of, we've had to swap the Scottish scenery for a Scottish accent and I'm delivering the awards uh, using some virtual trickery instead. Um, so in case you're not familiar with the Cyril Barnard Award, um, a quick explanation. Um, it's actually been running since 1962 and it's named after the medical librarian Cyril Cuthbert Barnard. And the prize is awarded by the Health Libraries Group Committee in recognition of outstanding services to medical librarianship. And this year, it gives me great pleasure to be awarding this prize to none other than Mr. Tom Roper. Um, I hope you're there somewhere, Tom. Hey, <laughs> welcome. It's nice to see another face on a screen with bad screens. <laughs> um, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, I've got some nice things to say about you, so if you can bear with me a second. <laughs> um, so Tom um, retired in February this year after a career spanning over 40 years. Um, he's worked in a range of library sectors from public libraries to further education and then of course into health as we know you. Um, he started his career in health libraries in 1991 at Edgware General Hospital, working in a range of roles from the NHS there through to medical schools and then on to Royal Colleges before joining Brighton Sussex NHS Library and Knowledge Services as clinical librarian in 2013. I feel like I should have a red book while I'm doing this. Um, Tom's long been an advocate for libraries and librarians. He was co-founder of the Voices for the Library campaign in 2014. In the same year, he was elected to the South Council and was also named as one of the booksellers' rising stars. We've also seen Tom hold the place on the editorial board for the Health Information and Libraries Journal. Um, he's had a stint as HOZ chair, so I'm sure you've sat in this hot seat before. Um, and in addition, he was also the first HLG webmaster. Um, he was a founder of the Mid, Mid, founder member of the UK Med, Med Lib Twitter chat. And at various times, he's also been chair of the Kent Surrey Sussex Search and Training Forum, committee member of the University Medical School Librarians Group, acting chair for Helicon, uh, chairman for the Animal Health Information Specialist UK and Ireland, um, and also the chairman for European Veterinary Libraries Group. So I think it's fair to say that Tom is both nationally and internationally renowned, having served in all of these positions, and not only that, but presented at a wide range of conferences and been published in a wide, wide range of professional journals. So HLG is today recognising Tom with the 2020 Cyril Barnard Award for his tireless campaigning for libraries and librarians and his engagement and commitment to improving health librarianship. Tom, it really is a pleasure to virtually present you with this award on behalf of HLG and the committee and from all our members and to thank you for all the work you've done over the years and also to have an opportunity to wish you a happy retirement. Um, I know it's really hard to do this online, but if everyone can give a virtual round of applause for Tom. <laughs> and I think by, as I say, some sort of visual trickery, I can hand you your award. Ta-da! <laughs> <coughs> So here is the, the, the award and Lindsay, HLG committee and members, I thank you very, very much for, for this honor. Um, as Lindsay told us, there've been um, 19 recipients of the Barnard Prize over 59 years. And they prompt me to, for a few thoughts that I'll share with you, I promise uh, as briefly as I can. Barnard himself still has a lot to say to us, I think. Um, he died in an accident in 1959, too young. He was uh, not far off retirement uh, from his post as librarian at uh, the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Um, and he, he left us a big legacy. Um, there's three parts to it, I think. Um, the first, which um, may not be known to everybody, is his classification, because it's not hugely widely used, um, but I did work with it myself in my time at the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons. He devised that quite early on in his career um, and was awarded fellowship of the Library Association for it. I'm not sure if you can get fellowship of SILIP for devising a classification these days. Maybe, maybe you should. Um, 
Secondly, and maybe for us, this is his most important achievement. He was the founder and the first chairman of what they then called the medical subsection of the university and research section of the Library Association. And that nearly 75 years later is the Health Libraries Group of SILIP. Um, so I note that we'll be marking our 75th anniversary next year and maybe we can do that um, at, at some gathering where we can all meet together and, and uh, uh, enjoy some refreshment, who knows. Um, then the third element, and again, I think this is, this is very important, is, is what he did for international um, cooperation. And I was reminded particularly of the significance of this yesterday when I attended, as I think some others here did, um, IFLA's Evidence for Global and Disaster Health webinar uh, on COVID-19. COVID-19 has shown us how the science, the medicine, the scholarly communication that we support, and how our own theory and practice as librarians are international or they're, they're nothing. And Barnard with William Bishop, who was the first recipient of the Barnard Prize, uh, alas, posthumously, and William Lefanu, so the names of Bishop and Lefanu are also ones that we remember in our memorial lecture. Um, they brought together the first ever International Congress on Medical Librarianship in London in 1953. And I think they would have been proud to learn that next year, the 13th ICML will take place and it will be for the first time on the continent of Africa um, in South Africa. So I think he has something to tell us about professional unity, professional organization, cooperation and networking. Um, now I'm a little surprised to find myself, if I'm honest, among the, the, uh, the to be the 20th of the 19 uh, recipients of the prize so far, because if you look at the list there, there's people who made profound and lasting contributions in a variety of fields, bibliography, library and database automation, building library networks, public health, patient information, international cooperation. And many of them made contributions in more than one sphere. 60 years from now, when we present the Barnard Prize, there'll probably be other uh, uh, aspects that we'll be uh, marking. Data science, genomics, artificial intelligence, robotics, areas of activity that we can't even predict yet. In paying tribute to all the past recipients, I do want to mention, make particular mention of two that we lost recently. Um, Shane Godbolt, who was a great influence on my own career, and also Roy Tabor, uh, a great builder of networks. There's more on that list that I'm proud to say that I've known professionally, and in some cases personally, and from whom I've learned a very great deal. In Edward Dudley's phrase, Edward was um, principal of uh, Polytechnic of North London Library School. Um, I now am a retired layabout. Um, I may not remain a layabout for, for long, it appears, but in conclusion, I want to thank you all for the prize. Wish you, HLG, the committee, well for the future and leave you with words from two people. One is Shane Gobbolt and the other is Robert Burton. Um, early in her career, Shane wrote in the Library Association record something very important that I think we, we always remember. And she said that at the end of all our work is a patient. And in Robert Burton's Anatomy of Melancholy, he quotes somebody he calls Cardan, which is an anglicization of the name of the Renaissance polymath, Gerolamo Cardano, who said that a library is physic for the soul. Um, so I would add that that being so, we are the physicians and I am very proud to have been one and to have your professional company, your friendship and this prize. Thank you. Thank you, Tom, um, well deserved. And I, I echo your, um, your hope that next time we meet, it will be in person and we can celebrate properly. Um, so moving on from that, um, we come to our presentation for today. Um, 
Joining us now, we have Joe Cornish and uh, Dominic Gilroy, who are going to talk to us about the new professional knowledge and skills base um, and the um, healthcare sector guide that goes along beside it. Oh, good, you've just appeared on my screen. That's excellent. <laughs> Um, Joe and Dom, um, I believe you have been made co-hosts, so I'm hoping that you'll be able to share your slides. So um, I will hand over to you. Fantastic. That's brilliant. Thank you so much, Lindsay. Um, it's lovely to be here with Dom. Dom spent lots of time with me over the last year or so, so I'm sure he's really pleased to have a bit more time with me again. I'm really thrilled to be here today uh, with you at HLG and I just wanted to um, echo all the, the thanks and congratulations for, for Tom as well. Um, he really certainly, certainly helped and it influenced me as I was starting to learn the, the healthcare sector from my public library background. So um, Dom, I'll... I'll do the slides if that's all right with you I can do yours as well so we don't switch over halfway through. Um, what we're going to look at today is I'm going to talk a little bit about the revised professional knowledge and skills base and the process and reasons behind that and then I'm going to hand over to Dom and he'll talk through the um, he'll talk through the, the application of the PKSB and how that works. So for those of you that haven't met me before, um, I'm Jo Cornish and I am Head of Sector Development for SILIP. I've been with SILIP for about five years in a variety of roles. Um, the, my department really looks after everything involved with helping library and information professionals be really great at their roles and to get the recognition they deserve. So lots of work around standards, qualifications, accreditation, professional registration, all of those sorts of things, along with training and CPD and also growing the profession into potential new markets as well. So that keeps me out of trouble. One of the big bits of work we did last year was around the revising the PKSB. Um, I'm sure you all know Dom, but Dom, do you want to do a quick introduction too? Hi everyone, um, Dom Gilroy. So I work for Health Education England uh, as Deputy Head of Knowledge and Library Services for um, the north of England, but in this context also leading the Workforce Development Programme. Thanks, Dom. Thanks. Okay. So as I've said, um, I'll, I'll give a bit of background and context. Um, the actual PKSB isn't going to be launched for the main select membership until September of this year. Um, but I'll explain as we go along that actually Health Education England arranged to have um, early access to that. They're sort of piloting it for us with their workforce. So um, some of you will have had the opportunity to have seen the revised PKSB and the healthcare sector guide that goes alongside it. Anyone else will um, who, who's a SILIP member will be able to have full access to those from uh, September. Um, I want to start by talking a little bit around the profession itself, you know, why, why this matters, why this is important, where we're going, where are we headed. So the library and information sector has fought long and hard for professional recognition and parity. It's a profession that is steeped in skills and knowledge applied in ethical practice, as brilliantly highlighted by all those lists of examples of, of winners of the Barnard Prize. Um, so that, that really gives you a, a sense of, of ethical practice, skilled, knowledgeable ethical practice uh, in action. We're all very proud of our profession. Uh, we're, we enjoy our engagement. We enjoy the um, opportunities it brings us. And, and we certainly will enjoy that opportunity to bring a benefit to an end patient or, or an end recipient of our services. Uh, and we can make life changing um, differences to those people. However, it's really important that we also recognize the challenges that we face as a profession. There is a lack of diversity in our workforce. We also have an aging workforce. We need to carefully consider how we're going to de de develop the next generation of professionals and leaders to make sure that we're, we're leaving the profession in a strong state as the rest of us move on. And there's also um, some direct challenges to us uh, in terms of a, a big deregulation push from central government, which was the, the base response that Lindsay was referring to. Uh, HLG formed part of that push. 
push back against uh, the suggestion of deregulation to courses, academic courses within our, our profession. All of these are significant challenges for us and we need to start thinking about how we're going to address them. It's essential that our professionals are not only skilled, but that they can see the value they are bringing to society, that they are proud of that identity. And what we want is for this to be an aspirational career choice that has diverse but robust roots in so that we can welcome people in. SILIP um, created a revised open and inclusive definition of professionalism, which was launched, launched in January 2020. Um, other things happened in 2020, which means perhaps it didn't get the airplay that it might have got otherwise. Uh, but it is um, it's something I'm very proud of. Liz Jolly read the uh, led the review and I worked on rewriting the, the definition. And what it describes is a profession that is welcoming of all who subscribe to our ethics, values, our ethos, our, and our skills and our knowledge. So we'll want to create something where anyone who has that mindset can be part of things, but that includes, um, they need access to a, a, a codified body of knowledge and skills to help them um, with that, to help grow the profession. One of the most important, um, one of the one of the most important uh, elements of our work as a professional association is to give you the building blocks to support your career. And we've created these foundation resources to help in that career and development. We feel that these are the things that will, that will help us to create a skilled and knowledgeable profession, delivering that in that ethical way, a profession that looks to drive forward change within themselves, their own development, within their services, but also for the profession as a whole to keep growing and learning. Uh, we want people to be proud of the profession and the skills they have and articulate the value to them. And we want people to have long lasting and fulfilling careers. And this is the suite of documents that we, we've been um, sort of working on over the last few years. One of the most important elements is the interplay between our ethics and values and our skills and knowledge. And we know that um, our ethics and values endure. They are what it is to be an information professional. They are what holds at, uh, holds at the centre of the PKSB and of our work and makes and are unique to us in a lot of ways. It's about the, those principles of um, access to information, you know, equality and equity of access to information, equality, diversity and inclusion, ideas around privacy and censorship. Um, those things are, are what, what we hold dear as a profession. But when we think about the services that we actually deliver, they evolve dramatically over time. If you think back to services we delivered 10, five years ago, even a year ago in current circumstances, they've changed dramatically. And that means that the skills and knowledge we need to deliver them change as well. So it's really important that the, the PKSB, which acts as our sector skill standard, has reflects those changes as well. So the PKSB holds our ethics and values at the centre, but it was certainly time to review and update the skills and knowledge within the, the main body of the PKSB. I'll share a timeline with you now where we are. So the original PKSB, which was built on the shoulders of the body of professional knowledge, for those of you that remember that, the original PKSB launched in 2014. So we had been running with that version for quite some time. In 2020, we were incredibly grateful to Health Education England, who provided the funding to uh, give us the additional capacity we needed to deliver the review of the PKSB. And to do that, we convened a working group, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a moment, as a task and finish group to revise that content. The group created a draft, which was then tested, extensively tested with over 50 stakeholder groups um, and HLG contributed to that as well. We then updated that draft, obviously, in light of that feedback, and it went through several layers of approval. In May 2020, um, which is pretty much where we are now, I suppose we're in just into June, aren't we? We created an interactive PDF of that new content. So it is the brand new PKSB content uh, in PDF form. And Health Education England have been piloting that with their workforce. 
Uh, and alongside this, we also created the Healthcare Sector Guide to the PKSB. This in essence replaces the PKSB for Health and Dom's gonna talk a lot more about that. So I won't, I won't cover that now. And what I will tell you is where the civic staff are with this process now. So we've got this beautiful new content, um, which we're really proud of and think is really um, great for the, the profession for now and future facing. What we are doing, though, is um, now having to um, feed that content through all our related products and services. A lot of CILIPS work runs from the PKSB, so our accreditation services, professional registration, how we shape our training and CPD offer, um, our weather state, all of those things, they all run from the PKSB. So the team are working really hard to update all our, all our resources so that we can launch everything together. That includes the online tool, which is the way in which most of you will have had um, contact with the PKSB, which is that sort of interactive wheel graphic that allows you to do self-assessment of the PKSB online. So that's also being updated and migrated as well for good measure. So both those things are happening simultaneously. So that's the timeline. I want to talk a little bit about the working group because we put a lot of thought into um, creating this working group. It's, it was a big um, responsibility really for the profession. And I think the working group felt the, felt the weight of that. So we made sure that we had representation from the, the four communities, library, information management, knowledge management, and data. And then we also thought really carefully about um, how to cover off other elements too, whilst keeping the group at a manageable size. So the group included two of the original PKSB authors, which gave us that sense of continuity and understanding around some of the original um, structure and some of the original inclusions and thoughts behind it. Um, and that was really interesting, actually, to see the evolution of, of ideas that they think included a sort of embryonic in that one that have now become mainstream uh, and deserve their own sort of space uh, within, within that sort of six year period. So that was really interesting for us. We also had an accredited learning provider, so someone who is running um, academic qualifications off of the, the, the PKSB content, a member of the professional registration panel, as well as representation from Devolved Nation, um, new, a new professional health, academic, public library and corporate viewpoint. So we were really trying to get a lot of bang for our buck, if you like. And you can see there's the eight members of the working group. Um, who were wearing several hats, some of them, um, to cover off those that representation. Uh, and it was a real privilege to work with that group. They were brilliant. You can see there how we approached the task, and we were brilliantly chaired by Keith Wilson, who did an excellent job in that task. So once the um, working group delivered their brief and created that draft content that I took to approval, they technically disbanded, but they are still very generously making themselves available to me to sort of test content and ideas as we go through the integration process. To let you know how we shaped that PKSB, well, the, there was a quality criteria that the PKSB working group worked to, uh, and this is what we were aiming for throughout the, the piece. It was important to us that we were championing equality and diversity in this piece of work. We also needed to make sure that it represented the, the whole um, skills and knowledge for the whole of library information, knowledge and data needed, needs to work for everybody. And it also needs to be applicable for all um, that choose to use that content. And that's quite a delicate balance because what it means is we have to des describe concepts, but without getting into sector specific language or sector specific um, products, because uh, it needs to be applicable to all. It needed to underpin those related services, which I've already described to you for SILIP. And we also wanted to create something that provided a positive user experience in terms of content and, and access. So the way we went about this was um, assessing and reviewing the existing PKSB content to see how um, accessible and useful, relevant it still was. We also had the brilliant opportunity, which I have to say also was enabled by HEE funding, so thank you again for that, to integrate into the report uh, the findings of the um, SILIP Tech, technology review. This was a report into the impact of AI, machine learning, robotics and automation on the skills of the profession. And it's a really great read. It's, it was published last month, uh, written by Dr. Andrew Cox from Sheffield um, for us. If you haven't had a chance to read it, do go and have a look. The, that report is 
full of looking at the new new technologies in inverted commas because they're not that new and you know they're, they're well established and we're using them but really focusing in on what that means for our skills and how we leverage value as we work through with these new technologies and we had early access to that which allowed us to thread that through the pksb content from the off which was brilliant um, so we didn't have to sort of retro engineer that back in we also um, identified knowledge and skills gaps and wrote the content to meet that criteria. We had a chance to rationalize the structure as well, look at how things were grouped, see if there were any new sections needed. And as I said before, we, we tested that content widely with the community to check that we were you know, properly representing um, the, the truth because this is the skill standard. It's meant to be for by the profession for the profession. So that was important to us as well. Just an additional note on the on the EDI side, um, because it was something that we didn't want it to be like uh, an appendix or an add on. We wanted to work really hard to thread that principle all the way through everything we were doing. Um, and there were several things that we did to strengthen our commitment to EDI in this work. One was that we um, we elevated the core principles, including ethics and values in the PDF version, we elevated that up right to the top. So it's the first thing you come across. And um, within that, we directly pointed to the Silip Ethical Framework because as the, the go-to reference document that gives more detail on ethics. And we also spelt out what those top line um, uh, headings were within that policy, uh, which includes equality and diversity. Throughout the piece, we added or strengthened language around managing bias in collections or understanding the bias, uh, impact of bias in searching and in information architecture. And we tried to make sure our, our wording was inclusive or, or was setting up a standard that we encouraged inclusive engagement and inclusive people management as standard. That is what should be happening. The working group also recommended that we create a separate piece of guidance around behaviours, how we live these, um, these uh, skills and behaviours ethically, how we apply them in practice as a behaviour. So I'm taking that forward with the CILIP um, senior leadership team to, to develop in partnership with the diversity networks. And then I'm going to just now run to, to finish up, I'm going to run through the main changes for you so you can now have a sense of um, what the big changes are. And then I'll hand over to Dom and he'll start to take you through how we can use the PKSB and what the healthcare um, sector guide looks like as well. So the main changes that we had was, as I said, moving the core principles up to the top in the PDF version. We were also explicit about the ethical principles at that top level and have signposted out to those core documents, the ethical framework and the professionalism definition. We added professional development as a core principle. Within, within the original PKSB, there was already understanding your organizational context and understanding your wider professional context. And we've added in professional development as that third, a third element there. Uh, and those of you who are very familiar with professional registration will recognize that those are actually the three assessment criteria for professional registration. So we wanted the three of them there together. We added in a new data management section that really focuses on, in on how our profession interacts with data. So we're not looking at sort of hard coding or IT, but we're talking about data management in the way that our information profession interacts and works with that. We separated knowledge management and information management to give them their own sections. So they stand alone sections now, whereas they've been somewhat merged before. We emphasize that we support leadership at all levels throughout. Um, this has been something that I hear a lot within Silicon, something that people have said around the pre about the previous PKSB that people considered the, the leadership piece uh, they, they say things like, I'm not in a senior position or I'm not a manager, therefore I, I, you know, I'm, I don't have the opportunity to lead. And we wanted to make it clear that being a leader isn't linked to a level of seniority or necessarily even managing staff directly. There are ways that you can exhibit leadership at all levels in all of our posts uh, in lots of different ways. And we wanted to really recognise and celebrate that. It's vital as we're growing the next generation of professionals that we can identify and support that leadership um, behaviour. We also did a lot of work on the literacy section. I think actually that uh, Dom and I, <laughs> the literacy section, lit literacy section was the one that we spent most time, I think it was fair to say. Um, and it, it's an enormous area. 
Uh, so we, this is what we, on balance, this is the work, the way we've set it up now. It may be that we want to revisit this or, um, it, you know, this might be a point for future revision. But I think it's testament to how much that work has developed over the last six years and people's awareness and interaction with it. So the new PKSB has fully expanded digital literacy, media literacy and health literacy into their own areas. We also recognise political, civic and numerical literacies, and all of that is within the literacies and learning section. There were some other literacies as well that um, on reflection, the group decided we would place within their own sections. We felt that they were more at home amongst their sort of family of related skills. So for example, we've put data literacy and AI and algorithmic literacy in the data management section and record keeping literacy is in the, the record management section. Throughout, we updated language titles, terminology, being uh, trying to make the language as accessible and, and, and user friendly as possible. And then within the generic skills and knowledge section the, the, um, of the PKSB, we added in some additional areas. So we've added in an area for reflective practice, teamwork, program management, consulting and consultancy services, user experience, events programming and management, and computational sense. And, and just before I move on and, and hand over to Dom, I just want to spend a couple of moments talking about computational sense because it was one of the um, sort of one of the, the big additions into the, the PKSB. So that term computational sense, some of you may be familiar with it, but actually I wasn't. Um, we lifted it directly from that technology review that Andrew Cox put together. And computational sense is really talks about within that skills area, it talks about how we as information professionals um, react to um, technology and our role within that, the sense that we are really uniquely placed to clearly understand the needs of users and to have a bridge to providers and be that interface in helping people really connect to technology and develop technologies that work for, for our end users purpose. But also that idea of, of being digitally curious, wanting to engage with technology, explore it, try it out, understand it, test it, so that we can grow the services that we provide um, into harnessing all the power of that sort of digital technology. So that was a, a little gallop through the actual PKSB. Um, as I say, it will be fully available um, to uh, SLIP members from September. And I will hand over now to Dom um, to talk through the health se healthcare sector guide. Dom, you can be very Chris witty and tell me when you want your next slide, please. Okay. Okay. Thank you, uh, John. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. So, uh, so thinking about how we use the PKSB, then um, I'm a member of the uh, of SILIP's professional registration panel. So my first thought when I think about the PKSB is in relation to professional registration of course so candidates who may be thinking about certification or chartership or fellowship or the new knowledge management chartership and fellowship offers um, or perhaps revalidating uh, obviously we can use the PKSB there to self-evaluate our skills and competencies and then prioritize areas for development and track our progress so so that's one way in which um, we can use this as an individual. But if you think about your everyday work, um, your organisation will usually have some kind of annual or perhaps more frequent uh, professional development review process. It's called different things in different organisations. The process by which you um, undergo some kind of annual appraisal and objective setting process for your particular role. And in that process, there's usually an opportunity to consider your own developmental needs and what you need to do in order to continue to develop and, and achieve within your role. So obviously the PKSB can offer you a tool to, to help that assessment. Um, in my own role within the NHS, I've been lucky enough in one post, I was even just allowed to use my PKSB self-assessment as the whole evidence, if you like, for that process. They didn't ask me to complete the local um, equivalent, I think because they recognize the superiority of the PKSB, but there you go, that's just my, uh, my impression. But what I would say when we're, when we're talking about using the PKSB in any of these ways as an individual is that 
you know, there's no expectation that you go through the whole document and start doing an analysis against every single skill. You may want to do that sometimes, and that's fine. But particularly when you're thinking about professional registration, the idea is that you pick a few priority areas to, to work on in your development. So a dozen or so, perhaps uh, up to 20, but do focus on priorities. You're not expected to use the, the whole, the whole, um, the whole uh, document. So if we look at the second column then, that's thinking about workforce planning. So thinking about your team that you work in or your organization, your library department, we can use the professional knowledge and skills base um, for a tool to undertake skills audit. So imagine that you've been asked as part of your strategy or your planning or your team development to consider what what roles you need, what skills you need, what competencies you need within your team in order to um, fulfill your strategy, your aims and objectives over the coming years. You can use the PKSB um, to map against your strategy to identify what skills are needed. You can then look at your own team and use this, the document to, to map out what skills you have got. And then obviously that will identify skills gaps and that'll help you then as you go forward to um, think about what skills are needed for, for, for the team, not just for individuals, but for the team in the future. But it will also help if you ever come to the point at which you need to recruit new staff. So people leave, you might want to um, tweak your, your job descriptions a little bit to incorporate these new skills and, um, and, and areas of knowledge. For any colleagues working in NHS libraries, obviously uh, some of you will be involved in the Quality and Improvement Outcomes Framework. Uh, that's the beloved uh, quality improvement tool that we've got uh, coming up. The first self-evaluation will be in September. And outcome four of that tool looks at the library team, if you like, the, the skills, the numbers, the competencies of the library team, and asks you to sort of think about, you know, what's needed for the future? What are my priority areas for, for developing my team? Um, the outcome itself reads, all NHS organisations receive library and knowledge services provided by teams with the right skills mix to deliver on organisational and knowledge for healthcare priorities. Well, um, when we're thinking about evidence for that outcome, uh, it, it, the document suggests that outcomes of staffing and skills audits are one piece of evidence which might be useful for this outcome. And obviously the PKSB offers an ideal opportunity to, um, to, 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 to focus around uh, the PKSB as a tool for the skills audit element of that work. So those of you that work in NHS libraries and may be responsible for the outcomes framework do bear the PKSB in mind for that, for that task as well. And the last column there about accreditation. So obviously, when we think about accreditation of, of, of training and education, we might primarily think about our higher education courses that offer uh, library school, library training, uh, library information studies options. So, so obviously the PKSB will now be used by, uh, by courses wanting to map to, to still its requirements there. But within health education, we're, England, we're also doing some work at the moment to develop a learning academy, which part of which will involve mapping the learning and development offers, the CPD offers that we provide to our NHS workforce, our NHS library knowledge services workforce, to the PKSB, that's part of the accreditation process. So by, by uh, mapping to the PKSB, that, that goes part way, if you like, to achieving this, um, this, this accredited status for our training. So that's another, re another option for our colleagues pro providing educational and training offers. Um, you know, if you're seeking SILIP accreditation, the PKSB will come into that uh, as a tool as well. Next slide, please, Joe. Okay, so um, we've mentioned that uh, we've now got the PKSB healthcare sector guidance, which replaces the former PKSB for health. And um, the work to develop this uh, document was led by um, Joe with help from colleagues from across uh, healthcare really. So not just um, Health Education England or the NHS, we have um, colleagues from um, Victoria Treadway from NHS Right Care, Helen Pullen from 
at University Hospital of Bristol and Western, Suzanne Wilson from Cumbria, Northumberland, Tyne and Weir, Leslie, who I think I spotted on the call from um, Birmingham Community Trust, and then we had Naomi Hall from Greater Manchester Mental Health, Andrew Milne from Imperial College uh, Library, and then Rachel Gledhall from Public Health England and Dina Max from the King's Fund. So uh, an array of people and, and myself, of course, from Health Education England. So to, to get different perspectives from different, uh, different elements of the, of the healthcare sector, really. And the idea is that the document takes the skills and competencies outlined in the general PKSB and tries to place them in the context of healthcare with the intention of improving the accessibility of the tool for colleagues working in this sector. And we do that by trying to provide illustrated examples of where these potential generic skills or professional skills are applied within healthcare. Uh, next slide, please, Joe. So for those familiar with the former PKSB for Health, you'll probably notice a slight change in the layout of the new uh, healthcare sector guide. Um, with the former document, we tended to list and comment on individual skills and competences one by one. Um, instead, now the document takes a section by section approach um, looking, providing a commentary for each section on what skills look like in the health sector. So the section shown here is section one on collection management and development. We intended the description to be sort of an overview really. So it's not exhaustive, it's a starting point for, um, for healthcare sector users, just giving ideas and examples of, of where the skills and competences in that section might be applied within healthcare and we see that it will be of value to colleagues working any colleagues working in the sector but particularly helpful perhaps to colleagues who may have moved to healthcare from other sectors or perhaps new professionals working in um, in health for the first time next slide please joe Um, in addition to the overview, we also provide for each of the um, sections, we provide a hints and tips and a list of resources which may be useful for colleagues who are interested in developing skills in those particular areas. Again, the list isn't exhaustive um, and we tried to be inclusive in terms of uh, what we included in there to cover examples from the different home nations and from different bits of the, of the health profession. Uh, most of the resources that we point to are available online, but we do include some um, facet books uh, publications that are listed on there. Um, and we do a little plug at this point by saying that if you're a SILIT member, uh, you should uh, be reminded and be aware that you get, do get a 35% discount on any uh, facet books. So do, um, do, do have a look at that and see if there's any that look like they may be particularly useful for your own skills development. Also within the healthcare sector guidance, uh, we have this um, final, final section which looks at what sections might be related to this one, uh, it, particularly in the context of healthcare. So we don't include that in the PKSB, it's PKSB itself, but in the healthcare sector guide, we, we sort of point you to other sections. So if you're interested in collection management, we suggest you may also want to look at sections 10, 11 and 12. Um, for similar for similar areas and similar skills. So I hope that you'll find um, both the PKSB and the healthcare sector guide useful um, in your in your work and in your professional development. And we've got an opportunity now for any questions from myself or Joe. So I don't know how you want to handle whether you want to, we could put hands up if you want to ask in person or if you're more comfortable putting questions in the chat, we could do that. Uh, um, I had a, a couple of messages whilst we were going along. Okay, so maybe great. shall I share and they came direct. So shall I share those in case there are other people that might sure, be interested? Yeah. yeah. So one of the questions I was asked was um, if you're 
work for um, the NHS, can you get access to this now? I'll let Dom answer that one. Yeah, so um, how we've done this is obviously uh, because the um, PKSB and the healthcare sector guide uh, the intellectual property of SILIT, we, we, we have to sort of have a little bit of um, care in terms of how, how access is granted. Um, what we've done so far is we all, all NHS uh, all NHS knowledge and library service managers will have been sent details of the of the PKSB and the links to that to share with their staff. If you've not received that, um, you know, do ask your managers. If you haven't, if the manager hasn't received them, please get in touch with me or our colleagues in HE, and we'll make sure you, you, that you do get access. But yeah. From now on, from now on, all um, NHS library staff should should be able to have access to that. Then. And then a, a related question was, um, if if I can access it now, which is brilliant, um, I'm in the middle of my chartership. How does that affect things? So um, when when you submit your chartership or any level of professional registration, you have to submit an initial PKSB assessment and then one at the end of the process to sort of show your development. Um, we have discussed this with the professional registration panel, and they're they're very supportive and of candidates and, and want to be flexible. Uh, so what I would say is that people are welcome to use that PDF self-assessment tool if they want to. That's absolutely fine. When we go live with the new online version, the wheel, the interactive wheel that's actually online, you won't be able to upload that PDF though. So you'll, you'll sort of have it for reference, but you, you won't be able to upload it into your, your PKSB. What we are going to do, though, is when we move over to the new version, we will migrate. If you've got a, already got an online version, we will migrate your data as best we can because it's not 100 percent like for like. We obviously can't do it perfectly, but we will um, we'll have mapped all the skills across and anything that can be mapped across will be mapped across. So when you go to the new PKSB, there should be a version waiting for you that has been pre-populated from your last report. And you'll have your previous reports as archive as well. So they'll, they'll be sort of safe. So between those two versions, you should be fine. But I, I mean, I have a, a member of the professional registration panel with me. I suspect that if you have filled in the PDF version now, and want to submit that as your initial PKSB for your chartership, I'm sure that the, the panel would accept that. Um, I'm Dom's nodding at me. Yeah. Like, we're, we're, speaking out of turn. It, it's intended as, so the PKSB, it's an, intended as evidence that you've reflected on your development and then undertaken development. So the format of what you submit from our perspective as assessors it is not vital. It, it can be whichever format you want to use. It's just the evidence that you've undertaken the process that we're looking at. And, and we will send out a series of comms with frequently asked questions and steps for all these scenarios. So Silla, again, that's another thing that Silla's working on now, these communications. So you'll, you'll be informed what's happening and when. And I think we've got some questions in the chat. Have we got time, Lindsay? Are we all right? Yeah. Okay. Right. Let's have a little look what's in here. How long is the shelf life of the version? That's a great question, Ruth. So the intention was, always the intention was, that they should be um, two to three years. So you can tell from the previous gap that we fell short of that last time. So what I'm going to look to do, it takes quite a long process to review. So I'm going to start looking for funding to start reviewing, um, hopefully in 22, ready for a, a sort of revised version in 23. What we're hoping is by doing it more frequently, the changes will be less dramatic, um, but there are still related um, issues around us having to repopulate the entire ecosystem of services, even if we make tiny changes. The other thing we're looking to do is um, create a way that we can capture people's suggestions as we go along. So if there are things people think we're missing um, or need changing that we're going to have a process where people can let us know and we'll capture those so again when we come to do the next review we'll already have a pool of information there of the things that the community is telling us they want um, to see change okay um and and then, a, yeah sorry go ahead i was only it's just the other question about will other sector guides be created joe oh. Oh, well, I would love to create other sector guides. So yeah, thank you, Don. I missed that one. Thank you, whoever asked that. Thanks, Don, for the prompt. So yeah, I would really like to, again, create a sort of suite of sector guides that if they worked for those, those sort of other sectors, 
Um, so you so we could replicate um, that for other sectors if they wanted to. It is quite a lot of work to create one, so it involves a bit of money, a bit of commitment because it you know it's resource. Um, but I'm very open to doing that with other groups if they want to do it. Um, I'd love to sort of create a suite that sort of the PKSB sits in the middle, and there's this suite of sector guides that sit around the edge that are in sort of a you know a uniform format. But again, that would all be collaborative. So. Um, there's there's been another question as well regarding um, EDI asking whether the EDI commitments cover um, the system systems and institution rather than just individual behaviour. When we're looking at documents like the um, ethical framework and the PKSB, um, those are really generally intended for individual use. However, there are bigger documents, bigger pieces around um, the changing lives agenda. So there's a whole work plan in place around changing lives, which is looks at things that are more um, institutional level. There's also uh, been a proposed uh, addition to the ethical framework that would look at organizational behavior. And when we're working with employer partners, we uh, they have to sort of subscribe to um, sort of levels of professional practice as well. So I don't think um, there's a clear answer on on that one. I think that between the different documents being applied in different ways, I think it is covered. But I think it, I think there would be an argument that that could be pulled together into a um, a more direct approach. And that, that's the end of the questions in the chat, I think. I don't know if there are any others. There's no more in the main chat. I don't know if anyone else wants to quickly raise their hand. Oh. Um, yes, we've recorded it and I think we'll put it on the website so you'll be able to get access to the recording afterwards. Um, I just wanted to say that the design looks absolutely brilliant. It's so clear. I really like the um, the extra hints and tips stuff as well. I just, I'm excited to use it. Thank you, Lindsay. We work with a really brilliant designer, and I always feed these comments back to her because she's she's an external, so someone you know that we resource that we bring in. Um, and she's worked with us for quite a while now and has created a lot of the brand. So I like to make sure that she knows that um, we, we get a lot of compliments on the design and brand uh, and it makes a big difference in how you can interact with that information. So I will pass that on. So thank you for saying that. OK, does anyone else have any questions, comments? Oh, Ezra, link to where the new guide is. Hi, Rosalind. Um, if you've not received the link yet, do you want to just email me outside the session and we'll sort that out for you? In fact, I'll email you. <laughs> and then obviously once we go live in September, they'll be situated on the SILIP website for, for members to access. Brilliant. Um, thank you both for coming along. Um, it was really good to see how everything's come together and, and what the, the, the changes are. I think if no one else has any questions, we can we can wrap it up there. Um, thank you to everyone for coming, um, both to the presentation and to the AGM. Um, I'm sorry for the slightly unscripted AGM. It was, um, I did stand in about 30 seconds beforehand, but I think we got there. <laughs> There's some thank yous coming in then as well. Okay, thanks everyone. Um, have a good rest of the day.